How many of you, uh, with, when you were being raised by your mama, did your mama give you one of those looks? Your mama didn't even have to say anything. Like she just looks at you in a certain way that you know what she's saying, like a raised eyebrow can say a whole lot. It's one of those looks that says, you better think twice, right, about what's getting ready to happen. You, you just telepathically knew, okay, okay. Or better when your mom or maybe even your spouse now uh, will, will volunteer you for something and then you find out about it later that you got volunteered for it. So I, I call it being voluntold. Like, oh, oh, uh, by the way, tomorrow you're going to be helping so-and-so move, you know, or whatever. And you're like, oh, okay, thank you, I suppose. You're asked to volunteer, but you're sort of given an order, you know. Well, today we're going to hear about Jesus. And you see this fascinating interplay in the story with Jesus and his mother, Mary. You get a little bit of this little, of, of their relationship and she essentially asked him to do something. Now, when we're being raised up, sometimes our parents ask us to do things, and we do things kind of, begr- we kind of do them begrudgingly, like, okay, I'll, I'll do, I'll take out the trash, you know. I don't think Jesus does this begr- begrudgingly at all. I think it brought him joy to do what we're going to read about today with turning water into wine. And uh, this is the third week of our series called Aha Moments, Moments of Spirit-Led Inspiration, or we should have called it Spirit-Led Revelation, stories in the Bible where, where the, the lights come on for people. And we'll see later in this story that for the disciples, the lights definitely come on after this first miracle, first recorded miracle of Jesus in John chapter 2. And we're just going to read through it, and I'm just going to talk through it while we start in verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now today in America, weddings last about maybe half a day. If you you count the rehearsal dinner and the rehearsal and the wedding and the reception, maybe a full 24 hours, and then the weddings are over with. Now, in Jesus' day, in the Jewish culture back then, a wedding could last three, four, five, sometimes six days. It's a week-long celebration. So this is a huge honor moment for whatever family is getting married that's putting on, essentially, this wedding. It's a very communal um, experience. It's even more so was a deep part of the social fabric of Jesus' day, and that was well-established back then. So if you consider the the social ramifications of running out of wine at this sort of event, you see this is kind of a big deal. This is a definite stain on how you're seen by your peers. So hence you see Mary's telling Jesus about the wine. Can you do something about this potential catastrophe? Now we don't know why the wine's running out. Maybe there's uninvited guests. Uh, maybe the delivery truck got lost. Uh, We don't know why the wine is out, but what we do know is that it's gone. And we know that the consequence of this is that the whole family is going to be essentially ashamed in the eyes of their peers. So what's the solution to this? Mary, ask Jesus. Ask Jesus to help us. We're out of wine. Jesus, will you help us out? And I love this, of course, that he helps But Jesus is there to help us even when we miscalculate, even when we feel the potential for shame and guilt. He's there to help us even when things go wrong, whether it's our responsibility or not. He comes to rescue us from our guilt, from our shame. So Mary had seen Jesus do amazing things in his life. I have no doubt, it's not recorded, but there's no doubt at the age until this story, he's probably around 30 years old, she had seen him do incredible things. Hence her question, can you do something about this, Jesus? She's not maybe not expecting him to do a miracle, but she's simply just saying, what can you do about this? And Jesus says to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, "Uh, do whatever he tells you to do. Just, just, just be listening for his words. So he's essentially using this formal way to address his mother by calling him woman. He doesn't call her mother. 
Why are you asking me to take care of this little matter? What does this have to do with me? Now, the Greek phrasing here is kind of peculiar. It's, you literally can read it as, what to me am to you? You see this pop up again very closely in the story when Jesus is a little boy and he's 12 years old. And Joseph and Mary at Passover go to Jerusalem as you do and they lose track of little Jesus and they don't find him for three days. And he's in the temple and he's teaching the rabbis and he's astounding them with his wisdom. And you see this closely this phrase pop up again with his response, a rhetorical question of, wouldn't you know I'd be here in my father's house tending to his business? Why are you surprised, right? It's a sort of question. He's all about his father's business with this statement to Mary. He's saying, my hour has not yet come. I am here to do the things he has called me to do. And I'm not, I don't know if that's what he's called me to do right now. He's essentially saying, my focus right now is on a whole other kingdom, a whole other perspective than just what you're asking me to take care of. He's not, he's not dissing his mom, but he is being focused and succinct in his statement. He's basically saying, I've got heavenly obligations I'm focused on. My hour has not yet come. I have to be obedient to my father's will. And that's what I'm here. I've come to do. I've come to fulfill all righteousness. I've come to live this perfect life. That'd be the perfect sacrifice for people's guilt and their shame. And all of this, I must provide for those things. And it's not my time yet. To f- and I must focus on these more important things. And the super cool part of this is that Mary gets that. She gets it. And being a good Jewish mother, she just says, do whatever he tells you to do. And so what does Jesus do, though? He does what his mom tells him to do. She she essentially says, oh, your hour hasn't come yet? I think it's happening right now. Your hour has come, Jesus. And here it is. So what does Jesus do? Well, Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. So Jesus changes his mind basically and asks, decides to help. But what's really interesting is he does this miracle virtually in secret. And and, in the video we just saw, it depicts that pretty well. He's in the back room He asked everyone to leave. No one knew. Even the master of ceremonies that eventually tastes this wine is confused. No one knows where it comes from. So he knows his hour has not yet come, but so he still chooses to help, but he does it on the down low, essentially. So the only ones who eventually figure it out at first are the servants and the disciples. And at a minimum, Jesus makes 120 gallons of wine. That's a lot of wine. Like, hey, Jesus, we're out of wine. Will 120 gallons work? Yeah, that'll do. That'll work. And these jars that are full of water, what are they for? They're for purification or ceremonial washing before worship services, basically. And the the beauty of this parallel is Jesus is saying, okay, you have used that water for external cleansing, I'm getting ready to provide something to you into the world that is an internal cleansing. One day, I will hold the cup of wine of the Passover lamb and say, this is my blood of the new covenant. This is my blood. That, and if you take of it, it will provide for you what you ultimately need, which is the blood for your souls to be saved. So the beauty and the poetry and the parallelism and the significance of the wedding of Cana cannot be overstated here. It is wondrous and perfect in how Jesus does this and is essentially his reveal party for who he is and what he's come to do. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So when they took it and when the steward tasted the the water that had become wine, he didn't know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the, bri- the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk and their taste buds aren't any good anymore. 
but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory. That's the thing with John. He loves talking about Jesus' glory being revealed. And his disciples believed in him. So we're going to unpack that a little bit more. There's really three aha moments I'm going to touch on real quick with this story that I think are very interesting. The first is that faithful action preceded the miracle. It took the action of people filling up water jugs in order for the the wine to even occur. They had to take water bucket by bucket from a well or a cistern. This would have taken a lot of time and effort. Water is very heavy. And and to fill up these jugs again, at least 120 gallons of water. And you've got to think what these servants are thinking while this is going on, right? They're thinking like, what is this rabbi thinking? We just washed before this banquet happened. Why are you refilling the water again? We don't need it right now. It makes no sense. Why should we refill? And then he's, they're probably also thinking, and then Jesus says, take some of that water to the master of ceremonies, the chief steward. Oh, really? You want me to take a cup of water to the head of the wedding, and thus I'll be embarrassed, he'll be angry, and, and like, why would I do that? And I would love to see that servant's face, though, when he's walking up with whatever kind of cup or clay pot he had to that master of ceremonies. I would have loved to have seen his face when he looked down and he saw it's not water at all. Sometimes God asks us to do things that do not make sense, and they are acts of faith through which the miracles of God can flow. And when we're faithful with the task, no matter how mundane it may seem or crazy it may seem, God can use those things to make miracles, can use that offering for aha moments in our lives and the lives of other people. So if you want to see a miracle, maybe be obedient in the moment, even when it doesn't make sense to you. If you're operating out of faith, it means that you're being led and that you're obeying his voice. Some of those servants, when Jesus said, fill those pots up with water, some of them could have said no. I don't want to do that. That doesn't make sense to me. But with an obedient heart that was subservient to his will, great things happened because of it. So for example, maybe you're in, you have problems with finances and you would love to have a miracle from God for the help with financial issues. But maybe God is saying to you, if you need to get out of debt, maybe cut up the credit cards first. Maybe make a budget. Maybe do all these things. Give God something he can use to bring the miracle through. That Give him something of faith that he can use. Give him clay, if you will, that he can form into something miraculous. But what a lot of people want from God is magic. That has no participation on our part. That's not how miracles work in the Bible. It's always people that participate with God in the miracle. Basically, without God... You cannot, but without you, God will not. And our actions done in faith can set the stage for God to do miraculous things, as we see in this story. The second aha moment is that the miracle was for everybody there. The wine is created. It's given to the chief steward to taste it. And then there's no conditions put on it, are there? The people probably began to consume it. It was for everybody. It wasn't say, oh, 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 you're a, you're a Samaritan or something? Or you're not with that certain family? You can't drink it? No. The wine was for everyone that was present at that place. And it's particularly fitting for this story on Martin Luther King Jr. weekend to, to be reminded that God's grace is for everybody. No matter who you are or what you look like or where you came from, God's love is for everyone. Jesus is for the whole world. He loves the whole world. And this miracle is for everyone. That even in a fallen world, the wedding at Cana shows us that God's business is joy. It has always been joy and always will be joy, providing fine wine for his people. There had to be a smile on Jesus' face when this was going on. You know, I love weddings. I've officiated many of them at this point I'll probably do a whole lot more 
and I love weddings. I could tell you a lot of great stories about weddings I've done. I remember one time I did a wedding, and the bride, um, in order to save money, which makes sense, she played the music off her phone that she would enter into the sanctuary to. And so uh, we're waiting, me and the groom are waiting in a side room, the door is closed, I have a little peephole, I can see where my cue is that we're going to walk in, and she said, this song's going to play, when it's over, you two come in, you know, we'd all rehearse it, and I'm looking through the people, and the song ended, I'm like, okay, let's go, and before I can open the door, another song starts to play, and, and I look in, and everyone is standing in the sanctuary, and they all have their hands over their hearts, it was the, play, it was the national anthem, began to play on accident on her phone. And I walked in, and, and when it was over, I almost wanted to say play ball. I thought we were going to start, have a, have a baseball game or something here. But, um, you know, I love weddings because it's when we're at our best, you know. We want to look our best. We want to, we you know, present ourselves. We're trying to, we're giving God and our families the best. It's that one time in life where everybody you really care about is in one place, and maybe some people you don't care about, but everybody that you love is present in one place. It's a very special time of new beginnings, of celebrations, of deep, deep joy, of, of, of you know, new family being formed. And it's particularly fitting that Jesus is doing this miracle, and he's basically saying to the world, the bridegroom, it's me, has come for his bride. And you see that story throughout the, the, really the New Testament of, of weddings, of God being married to his people, of essentially the beginning of the Bible starting Adam and Eve with a marriage. And it ends in Revelation with a marriage of heaven and earth and the bridegroom and the bride coming together. And so it's a time of expansive joy at weddings. And for the disciples that were witnessing this, you know for them, it, well, John tells us, this is the moment they started to believe. When they witnessed this miracle, this is when they started to go, there's something different happening here. And we, now we believe in who Jesus says he is. And it was so much so that John had to record it. And I like to think the word had to spread at the party, even though Jesus did the miracle in secret, you know it had to spread. Where did this wine come from? This is delicious, this is amazing. Jesus did it. He did it. Everyone had to know and see and believe. And John even says, this is when we, had, we saw his glory. We saw what he was capable of, and we believed. The third aha moment is that Jesus uses the ordinary to make the extraordinary. You know, I like to think that Jesus could have made wine out of anything, out of nothing. He could have just said, wine in the jars. But no, he said, fill them up with water first. What is more ordinary and mundane and life-giving, though, than water? But that he chooses to make something from something. Not, not nothing from something or nothing into something, but he makes something into something. He takes the world as it currently is and, and the world that he's made, and he takes what is natural and makes it into something supernatural. He takes something mundane and makes it miraculous. He takes something ordinary and makes it extraordinary. He levels up what could be into what should be. Because with God, there's no limits. You see Jesus do this all the time. He always takes something and turns it into something greater, right? Oh, you've got five loaves and two fish? Oh, here's a whole lot more of that. You're gonna go out the boat and catch one fish? How about 337? Oh, you think the storm is going to kill you? Boom, it's over with the sound of my voice. Oh, you can't see? Your vision is impaired? Let me spit in some mud and rub it in your eyes and you'll be able to see. He's always taking what is in the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. The supernatural into the natural. He's not working in spite of it. But he's, t he's like a potter working with clay. He's taking what's already there and he's forming it into something new and he's bringing heaven to earth. As it is in heaven, he's doing now on earth as it is in heaven. And when I hear these stories, it's like, it, it, 
it makes me just have so much wonder and awe about who Jesus is and that he's capable of doing so much with what's already present in our lives. There's a quote by G.K. Chesterton. He said, the world is not lacking in wonders, but a sense of wonder. You know, that's from the, that's from the 19th century. People were lacking in wonder back then. Now in 2022, there's a whole lot more bitterness, in my opinion, and jadedness than even then. There's even more lacking of wonder. A more, uh, we're in a culture of outrage and bitterness that, that we, we really f- can forget the joy that comes by just standing in his presence. That we serve a Jesus who, who breathes galaxies into existence through whom all things have been made and by whom all things hold together. A high view of Jesus is the only view. For that's who he is. The Savior that can calm the storm with his hand and change water into wine and take the ordinary into the extraordinary. My friends, what ordinary thing do you hold today that looks like just a lump of clay? It's no good. It's just a cup of water, Jesus. It can't be anything more than that. Don't limit what God can do in your own mind. Don't limit him. He's bigger than that. Whatever view of God you have, don't limit him because he's limitless. All things are possible, Jesus says, to those who believe. So whatever ordinary thing you have to offer, which for all of us is about all we have to offer, let us offer that to him today. And think, and don't believe the lies that it's, going, it's as good as it's going to be with my relationship with God. But let it be a new year and a new opportunity to take your ordinary and make it extraordinary. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that you can take the ordinary in our lives and do so much more with it. Thank you that you forgive us for the ways we limit you, God. We limit what you're capable of. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are our healer. You always have been and you always will be and you're making new creation out of the dust of our lives, out of the ashes of who we are and our broken sinfulness. You are making us into new creations. And yes, all we can bring to you is our ordinary, but God, you don't want us to stay there, but to be people, Lord, that are being reminded of our extraordinary birthright You have come to make us sons and daughters of the King, making us children of God. God, without you, we cannot. And we thank you, God, that without you, without us, God, you will not. I pray for anyone listening today that they would take a step forward in faith to you, God. They would trust you more with their lives, with their family, with their marriage, with their job, with their finances, with their future, and not and see that their pl- trust in you is not ill placed, but it is the best place to go. Take us and mold us, O oh God. Bring healing to all those listening today. In Jesus' name, Amen.